Hello. Today's episode is with Jeff Schwartz, who is a bassist, creative musician, improviser, librarian, and writer on music based in Los Angeles, California. Jeff and I get into an interesting conversation about creative music, its history, Jeff's history as a writer about music and a musician himself, going all the way from Santa Cruz to Bowling Green to Austin, and then finally to LA. We get into some of the interesting ties between politics and and creative music and improvised music and the jazz world in general. And we talk about Jeff's upcoming book, which should be available to the general public next year. But before we get to that, please remember to like, leave a comment, and subscribe to my channel. I operate as a musician and a podcaster on a value-for-value value model, which means that if you derive value from my content, whatever that is to you, I ask that you respond in kind, either with a like or a comment, engage in the community, or you can also subscribe to my Patreon with a link below, or you can donate to my Venmo or my Bitcoin QR. Welcome to Music in Mind, Music in Mind, with Anthony Coffey. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Jeff Schwartz. He is a bassist and librarian and writer and improviser, and... Um, we met, um, I think the first time we met was a couple of years ago at the Cecil Taylor Conference in New York. I think uh, I knew about you, and you might have known about, we, we had similar circles in Southern California, but I think we officially met at the, uh, the Cecil Taylor Conference in 2019. Does that sound right? That sounds right, yeah. Cool. Well, well how's it going? <laughs> oh, it's pretty good. That's good. That's good. Um, what, what, what are you up to lately? Oh, sure. Well, you know, I've surprisingly a lot of performances have come Great. back for me. Um, I play in the Santa Monica Symphony and we mm -hmm. just wrapped up our uh, season. Um, we've been doing large indoor events, but wow. people have been vaxxed and masked and carded okay. and... Um, for a while, they mm -hmm. were uh, testing all of the wind players before every performance. Oh, rehearsal. I see, because they can't, right. Yeah, they can't mask. Um, and I don't think anyone has gotten sick. And great. The shows have been great. Um, it's also been a really interesting and challenging year for us because our music director passed away last year. Oh, and, okay. Um, so they've been auditioning new uh, conductor candidates. Every mm -hmm. show has been a different guest conductor. Oh, and wow. Then they've, and then they've been polling the orchestra on how we like working with them, uh -huh. which has been a super interesting thing. Um, I don't know how much you want to talk about orchestra music, but I, I can talk about it for a little while. <laughs> no, orchestra music is it, great. Actually, the, it's it's something I was thinking about, especially since you engage in both the, the classical world, the orchestra world, and the, the improvised and experimental world. And it's interesting that they're asking you, uh, the, the, the orchestra to give input like that. Would you say that the Santa Monica Symphony has sort of a, a collective vibe like that, where everybody has say in the organization? Um, you know, it's really nice that they're doing it. Yeah, that's great. And I um, love hearing it. There are a bunch of musicians on the board mm -hmm. of the orchestra, so that matters. Um, yeah. They're... Uh, let, let me think how much I want to get into this. It's, it's okay. We, uh, we, no, we, no, it's really, I think that there's probably a way to kind of wrap this around to some of the stuff that I think you'd probably be, you know, that's more creative music oriented. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing is that the Santa Monica Symphony is an almost all volunteer orchestra. Uh -huh. There are a few paid chairs because that's a union thing, and I'm right. not sure exactly how that works. Okay. Um, but it has had some really great results because some of us who I would say are, you know, B-list classical players at best, like myself, are um, get to play with people who are definitely A-list. Uh, members sure. of LA Phil, First Call Studio cool. players, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, having, having, you know, been somewhat modest about the orchestra, I'd say it's the best orchestra of its kind in L.A. that many of us are, you know, very serious performers of other kinds of music mm -hmm. or music teachers Absolutely. or instrument yeah. dealers or managers or librarians. Um, 
you know, a lot of people who went to conservatory and then couldn't get in a major orchestra and figure out something else to do with their lives. Sure, so sure. Little, you know. Um, the question of the um, involvement of the musicians is a really... Um, a few years ago, our old music director um, and some of the board members decided it would be a good idea to do a fundraiser with um, Dennis Prager, who's a right, mm. uh, radio host and has a YouTube channel called Prager U, which I definitely do not recommend okay. people look at. <laughs> and um, a b bunch of people in the orchestra kind of organized a, a protest and boycott of that show. Oh, wow. And okay. it was uh, quite a big deal. It was on NPR and in the New York Times. And, wow. Um, yeah, it kind of forced me to become more politically involved, which is a, a big part of my life now, too. Some, oh, of the, okay. uh, some of the other members, you know, you know, it was a real, like, gut check. Like, well, you're upset about this thing, but are you upset enough about it to skip what's going to be a really fun gig? Sure. Ah, yeah. I, that, that, it is an interesting question about when, when, you're, when you're working on something, especially something creative that you've put put your heart into and put, put your efforts into and your emotional labor into, then deciding that it, it doesn't fit in with your conscience or something like that, when, when to make that decision, how much to put up with. It's also, I think, a big difference between being like a professional musician right. and, uh, and not that, you know, mm -hmm. if you're a professional musician and you get called to play at, you know, the Trump Resort. <laughs> yeah. You sure. Know. Yep. Um, but if you're not. Right. If you don't need the money. That's true. It's a powerful position to be in. If you don't need it, you can say no easily. Right. And, yep. you know, well, the worst thing that happens is people stop calling me for gigs that don't pay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's not so bad. Yeah. Um, but that that that's an, it's interesting to uh, to look at music from that aspect of of how it relates to the the political sphere and how as a musician you relate your own practice to that. Yeah, my wife and I went to hear Angela Davis speak last night at Disney. Hall oh wow! On on uh, uh, creativity and social change or something mm -hmm. like that. And, okay. Um, so that got me thinking a lot about. Um, you know, it, it was nice preparation for this, although I would, you know, definitely not put myself in her league as, <laughs> as an intellectual or activist or, you know, et cetera. Sure. But but actually, I, you, I mean, you, you have several you have several papers out. You have uh, some some resource material out that you've published on free improvisation, Cecil Taylor, all sorts of things like that. Um, so actually, it's, where, where does that fit into your musical practice? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. And it's also a chance for you to, to plug something as if this was a talk oh, show, which is <laughs> that um, I have a book on uh, free jazz coming out for um, in a State University of New York Press. Great. That's uh, amazing. It's going to be the first book in their uh, Popular Music Styles series. Uh, mm. The hardcover is going to come out in October, and it's... Uh, priced at the university library price. Okay. Um, but then uh, in March 2023, there will be a paperback, which is in the uh, you know consumer price range. I see. Um, is it going to be broadly available? Yes. Well, Great. I mean, you know, you'll be able to get it at the, you know, non-existent bookstore near you. Um, <laughs> right. But you can definitely order it from the press. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully, you know, Powell's and the Strand will carry it. And, um, you know, of course, you know, there are other places to get books, which I don't want to encourage people to shop at. Right. Sure, sure, sure. I understand. Uh, um, but that's exciting. Congratulations. Well, thanks. Um, but how does it fit into my thing is a more interesting question, which is um, a lot of the writing I've been doing about this music has been recycled or improved stuff from my dissertation, mm -hmm. um, which was in American studies and... Um, was about uh, free jazz and the black arts movement mm -hmm. and uh, kind of played uh, Mary Baraka and Bill Dixon off of each other as different models of the role of music in revolutionary politics. Mm. And um, 
So I um so basically while I, I well, long story short, uh Benjamin Pike had got his book Experimentalism Otherwise mm -hmm. uh published uh while I was sort of still working on mine. So, you know, and he definitely did a better job of dealing with the Jazz Composers Guild than I did. He was able to do some uh, you know, primary research. And oh, okay. talk to Bill Dixon and uh, Carla Blay and a bunch of people. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, uh, but over time, I've been kind of cutting off pieces of the dissertation and polishing them up and publishing them in different spots. So oh, cool. the Cecil Taylor uh, paper that I gave at that conference yep. was sort yep. of a, a development of some things in there. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, book, uh, Free Jazz, a... Um, Research and Information Guide, which I published with Rutledge, I think in 2018, mm -hmm. um, is basically the bibliography from that book, but then like cut up and blown up um, to be like, you know, it's over 2,500 items and they're annotated. And Yeah, it's great. I mean, it's, it's, it's such a useful uh, uh, sort of uh, list of sources. It's great. I like it. I've used it. I've looked at it a couple of times. I, thanks. And yeah, yeah. Fortunately, they did a somewhat reasonably priced paperback edition as well. Um, yeah. Uh, there's also an ebook edition, which um, I think is probably searchable, which yes. makes it a yes. lot That's what more I found. handy. Yep. Yep. Yeah. They, well, thanks for buying it. Um, <laughs> it's great. Or pirating it, uh, you know, but anyway. <laughs> uh, and then I had a chapter in a book that came out in, in Finland called Free Jazz Communism, which was about oh, interesting. Uh, Bill Dixon and Archie Shep's uh, performance at the 1962 Helsinki Youth Festival, Okay, which was a kind of communist-sponsored uh, cultural festival. Interesting. Um, okay. Yeah, it was super amazing because the uh, CIA uh, organized a counter-festival Oh, through, okay. Through some like Yale undergraduate who was definitely not a CIA agent, um, right? But they got like Jimmy Jeffrey to play at there at the uh, CIA festival, and I think Herbie Nichols. Wow! So it's like he, you know, this is music that really nobody wants, but here it is on both sides of the Cold War. That's wild. It was, yeah, and it was great to be in this book with the Finnish people because the Finnish people were able to get into these great archives there. Mm -hmm. And they had, um, you know, all kinds of photos and news sources, and they did a new interview with Archie Shep. And mm -hmm. actually, there's a little bit of Angela Davis in that book, oh. too, because she, mm -hmm. uh, she actually attended this thing when she was like a teenager, I think, when she was studying with Marcuse at Brandeis. Uh -huh. I guess wow. she was, you know, uh, an undergraduate, but probably still a teenager. She's, Neat. you know, a prodigy. Uh-huh. Right. Um, it's... Yeah. So the new book is kind of, I think, the last... Uh, Kind of the core parts of okay. the, like not so much the Baraka versus Dixon stuff mm -hmm. because Pikett did that so well, but there is still a lot of Baraka and a good amount of Dixon in there because how can you not? They're major <laughs> intellectuals of sure. this music in the '60s. Sure, um, sure. And um, what makes this book better than my dissertation? Um, well, first of all, it's written for more than, you know, five people to read. Right. And yep. I had a very tight word count on it. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know, just a much better person than I was when I wrote it. But more importantly <laughs> than all of those things is that um, I've had, you know, maybe 15 years of, of actually performing this music at a pretty yeah. serious level, which mm -hmm. I did not when I wrote it. I really had not played like free jazz at all when I wrote it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I had sort of, you know, screwed around maybe playing an Ornette song with friends or something. But since then, I've, you know, gotten to play with, you know, very fortunately to, to, to play with, you know, people like Bobby Bradford or the thing we did with, uh, you know, Karen Borka yes. and Ross yep. Moshe and mm -hmm. Elliot mm -hmm. Levin. And, you know, if, if, you know, you know, at least as well as I do, that, you know, really the only way to understand Cecil Taylor's music, for example, is to talk to the people who, who played right. with him. And yep. that he didn't, you know, write a manifesto except for the liner notes to the unit structures yep. album. Yep. And that's mm -hmm. more of like a poem. Yes. So, you know, and then also 
very, you know, I've been was very fortunate to go to the uh, Vancouver Creative Music Institute a couple of times and the Creative Music Studio a few times and get to hang a little bit with, you know, folks like Evan Parker and mm -hmm. Henry Threadgill and, wow. um, and, you know, people who had played with Ornette and mm -hmm. learn about how that music works from the people who actually did it. Um, so I'm trying to wrap some of that music, that information into, into the book. Right, right. That, what I find interesting is that frequently high-level practitioners of types of music don't spend a lot of time writing about music or talking about it in a technical way. And it, it, it's sort of similar to the problem of, um, say, music theory versus music production. Hmm. And uh, I, I find that I go, I go through periods where I like writing more or where I sort of distance myself from writing about music and I would rather just play it. And so it, it's kind of a complex relationship. Um, do you, how do you feel about the relationship between writing and practice? Yeah, I think... Um... I, I feel like it's not that different from being like, you, you probably had this experience too, although I, I suspect you're a little bit younger than me, where you like playing, you know, when you first fall in love with rock music right. and try to figure out how to play it. And part of figuring out what's going on in a, you know, Led Zeppelin song right. or a Soundgarden song or whatever is just like figuring out how to put it into your body and make it come out of your right. instrument. Absolutely. And so that's, you know... I think that's the same thing with Cecil Taylor's music, you know, that it's one thing to understand how it works, you know, uh, on the, you know, in the scores and all that, which right. is, you know, a breakthrough once you, you know, <laughs> understand <laughs> that they're doing that. Yeah. Um, and, but then another is to actually like, like perform it mm -hmm. and understand the kind of physical and mental process. Absolutely. Of, getting you know it might be eight letters written on a piece of paper <laughs> yep. that turns into 20 minutes of music oh yeah oh yeah um i i think what you yeah. just said there was really important about getting it into your body so whether it's soundgarden or whether it's cecil taylor i relate music very strongly to dance hmm. and and i feel like in certain ways certain types of music are sort of a different version of dance maybe a, mm. an opposite side of a coin or something like that um so that that idea of getting it into your body which is where i struggle with with the the writing piece i remember there was a comment at that cecil taylor conference where somebody said it's it's unit structures not unit structuralism which was interesting because i I have a tendency when I write to gravitate towards something very structuralist. I like these sort of like very nerdy systems that I can talk about because it makes it easier in some ways to discuss it versus sort of the fluidity of the embodiment. It's harder to develop language for it. Hmm. Well, I don't know if I can make this connection, but I'll try. I mean, uh -huh. something we're dealing with, we deal with a lot in, in like uh, political discourse, mm -hmm. right, is, is the idea of... Uh, uh, hegemony and common sense in the unmarked position. Sure. Where there's certain stuff that seems just normal. It's uh -huh. like water to the fish, right? Um, mm -hmm. That you don't notice that it's there. You take it for granted. Right. And then there's stuff that's like from another planet and you need to, you know, it seems crazy. Mm -hmm. um, right now, the conservative group in my town is call, calls themselves common sense. Um, oh, which is a way to erase that they're being political. Right, of course. Yeah, yeah. So in a way, I think to talk about some musical stuff being like formalist or uh -huh. requiring a lot of intellectual intervention mm -hmm. just means that you haven't shedded that stuff. Yet. Sure, absolutely. That, that yeah, the yeah. blues scale feel, feels the same way for about the first week. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yep, yep. Um, and... Uh, Something I, I put in my book is, uh, you know, um, which uh, Liberty Ellman, who's, you know, an incredible guitar player, mm -hmm. um, he talks about the first four or five years he played with Henry Threadgill. He, he, could, he, he, he said the stuff he played sounded great, but it wasn't right. Mm. Because it was Interesting. based on, because Threadgill has this whole intervallic system. Right, yep, yep. 
and you know it it's in a, I think in a lot of kinds of music like you could right you can you can improvise something that sounds good but isn't right sure and the the idea yeah i mean the rightness like i i hate to say it but you know that as much as i love him you know anthony braxton playing standards right uh -huh. like it might sound but no Interesting, um, interesting. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Somebody, somebody's <laughs> going to come to my house. I'm going to get excommunicated uh -oh. from the... I, I, from I have to say, I love, I love his, his solo uh, rendition of Round Midnight. Hmm. Just, it doesn't, he doesn't even play the, the head until way, way, way late, and it's, it's crazy. You wouldn't even know it was Round Midnight for a long time. <laughs> So maybe that's not a great example. I it might, it might be. No, 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 no. No, it's it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> I'm I'm but, interested in in what rightness it what rightness well, is with music. Yeah, it's crazy. Or Cecil, Cecil Taylor's yeah. music, right? Uh -huh. you, you'd say, well, here's this pitch set, and it's uh -huh. also an interval set, and you can manipulate it in all these different ways. You can mm -hmm. play it forwards, you can play it backwards, mm -hmm. you can play it upside down. Right. But there's also some stuff you can do which is just not in that. Right. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in most of these musics, right, and this might be, uh, uh, you know, there's a, you can exceed the system. Of course. Yep. Right. Which, um, but, um, yeah, anyway, I'm sorry, now I'm. I'm kind of recapping points from the book and um, not well, that's, really that, doing them justice. <laughs> well, it, it's okay. I'm I'm, I'm fascinated by the, the sort of the, the the point you're getting at about rightness and that thing you just said about you can you can exceed a system. I mean, it's something when when I was an undergrad uh, studying composition, you know, they teach us to develop these systems for composing, and the problem is that then we all are stuck in these systems. And so like, it sounds all right for about a minute. And then it's like, wow, this is incredibly boring. So I, I think, I think there is something very powerful to, to what you were saying about starting with something, a, a unit structure, if you will, and, and finding a way to exceed that system, but using it as a starting point as a, a yeah. springboard or something like that. Yeah. Well, I, that's, I don't know if you did this, but after we did that uh, uh, ensemble performance, mm -hmm. uh, I went back and listened to the uh, Winged Serpent album, oh, which okay. most of those tunes were from. Mm -hmm. And also there's a live gig by that band, the Orchestra of Two right. Comments, which yep. you can see on YouTube. And, you know, having played that material, I was able to recognize it. Mm -hmm. But they played it in all different combinations. You know, yeah, there, might, there would be a cell from this page and a cell from that mm -hmm. page. Mm -hmm. And the titles of the pieces, you know, I don't know if the record company made them up or what, but they didn't, <laughs> yeah, right. you know, correspond to what was on, you know, the papers that we had. Right. Um, so that's... Um, you know, the... The 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 composed material is, in large part, I think, a way to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, to uh, it's a place to take off from. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, but it is important, I think, mm -hmm. that it's there. It's not important to give a flawless performance of what's on the page, right? Obviously, <laughs> that would be an interesting I experience. Don't trust that, <laughs> yeah. Um, but. Um, if you think think about more kind of formulaic free jazz, where there's like mm -hmm. a head and then time right. no changes, yep. You know, does it matter which ornate head you play before you start playing time no changes? Yeah, you're going to play completely different, right? Mm -hmm. Or you should, right? It'd, Absolutely, it'd be disappointing if you didn't. Or, it, but it's not just a free jazz thing, right? It matters which uh, blues head you play, it before, mm -hmm. uh, you know, yep. which Charlie Parker blues even. Mm -hmm. Hopefully you won't play the same thing on Now's the Time that you'll play on Billy's Bounce or whatever. Right, right, right. So actually, br bringing that into the the sort of the, the more traditional or, or classic jazz realm, I, I I heard I found some recordings of you playing uh, playing some more straight ahead jazz. So so where does that fit into your your practice? Oh yeah, well I tell you what the um, my um, 
education was um, such as it is. Um, mm -hmm. My high school band director was uh, basically a, a touring pop musician and studio musician. Oh, and okay. He really kind of taught us all that way. Mm -hmm. uh, we were his first batch of, of students. Uh, so he, I think, thought that we were all, you know, just very short studio musicians. Uh, so that there was this sense of like, well, you, you need to be able to play whatever they put in front of you, uh -huh. you know? Um, and as I got into more weird music I, or whatever you want to call it, sure, I felt sure. like, well, that was s definitely still, uh, uh, you know, a, a, to me, a valuable pr approach that, mm -hmm. uh, it, if you're listening to, you know, Naked City or the Art Ensemble of Chicago, mm -hmm. Right. Like, well, these are people who have to be able to play, you know, any style of music, right? Absolutely. They might play, you know, a funk song and then a country song and then a bunch of noise and then bebop and, you yeah. know, whatever. Uh, but I was thinking about this as I was coming home from work, uh, is that it's, that's also kind of true if you're into Beatles. Right. If you're making the White Album, you, know, you have to be <laughs> sure. able to play Martha, My Dear. You have yep. to be able to play Revolution. Yep, yep. Um. So I think that that's, you know, a, 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 you know, playing on, being able to swing on changes is a, mm -hmm. a fundamental part of American creative music. And Absolutely. Yep. As I've kind of gotten to know some of the, the masters of this music, mm -hmm. I see how fundamental it is to their practice. You know, someone like Carl Berger or Bobby Bradford, mm -hmm. you know, um, and uh, transcribing a little bit of this music. I mean, I'm not like a great transcriber, but I did sort of set out to like write out a bunch of heads of mm -hmm. like free jazz music. Mm -hmm. um, and I was really surprised by how many of my favorite tunes were like blues and rhythm changes. Yeah, of course. Um, I mean, you know, and not, you know, Ornette and Bobby Bradford and David Murray and mm -hmm. even Oliver Lake and, you know, Julius Emphill or, all those mm -hmm. folks, you know, wrote in those forms. And to some degree, you know, that that was really... Yeah. I, I remember I was taking um, uh, improvisation lessons with Kay Akagi down at, at UC Irvine when I, when I was doing my master's down there. And um, I, I did... I still don't. I don't consider myself a jazz musician um, in any real sense. I haven't, I haven't studied it to the degree where it would be fair to call myself that but so i said that to him and he said well let's start with the blues and uh because I, I had i i came from playing rock music and classical guitar so the blues fits the instrument much more easily as a starting point and he was showing me all these bb king tunes that he would play for you know 16 20 minutes just go and go and go and go and go and it would start so small just this little this little phrase that he's just singing on the guitar, and then he starts singing with his voice. And by the end, the whole band is blaring. You know, he falls down on stage, and they have to pick him up, and it's this whole show. It's, it's great. But um, I was also really, I loved free jazz. I, I fell in love with it. Probably, actually, the connection to me was dissonant metal music and, and Primus and things like that, and, like, that, that excitement and the sound. And so what he told me is, think about free jazz is that ending point of that B.B. That King tune. You see where they got? Start there. So the basics are all there, the fundamentals. But you don't have to build up from this little grain. You can start at the that level of intensity if you know how to do it. It was it was interest, it, was, it was an interesting way of describing the the relationship of the the basis of the blues into something as as complex as free jazz. Yeah, yeah, that's super interesting because I think you know when I think I've learned about free jazz from library books. Uh -huh. um, I mean, I remember getting this. There's a book by Len Lyons called "A Hundred and One Great Jazz Pianists." Okay, it's a terrible book, but and <laughs> I mean the represent the issues of representation and it are really it's really bad. bad. Okay, but. Um, 
the descriptions of some of the records, you know, the, of Cecil and mm -hmm. maybe, I feel like the prop, maybe Chick Corea with the Circle mm -hmm. Paris concert or something like that. They were really evocative, you know, and they really made me want to want to hear that music. Mm -hmm. But what connects to you talking about metal is that a lot of the um, 80s LA punk bands were very interested in uh, free jazz and free right. jazz okay. music. I mean, Black wow. Flag, The Minute mm -hmm. Man, yep. Uh, yep. Absolutely. You know, Sack and Trust, and uh, Universal Congress of, and uh, Quill Frederick, and... Um, you know, so that leads you pretty, pretty directly to, uh, you know, to Nels Klein and, and so on. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, it, the, the connection between punk and other types of music is, is wild. I, I ended up writing some funny article at one point about, about, uh, history of reggae music. And, uh, I found this connection to punk and reggae music in England and how they used to tour punk bands and reggae bands would tour together throughout the UK. It was wild. But the but the revolutionary musics like that 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 sound seemingly very different end up finding homes together. Yeah, yeah <laughs> it's I, an no, interesting idea. It, it, yeah, and I think you know, for for a band like like the Clash or the Slits, I think mm -hmm. a lot of that was was the politics of the music that they identified with. Right, right. I think that. Well, the, I don't know if I can support this, but I feel okay. like for a lot of the um, L.A. punk musicians checking out uh, free jazz, it was a, a kind of ex experiment, the experimental mm -hmm. part of it and mm -hmm. uh, the uh, being able to jam without being a virtuoso in a conventional sense. Right. Yeah, there's, also, there's that in punk. And also without the sort of hippie baggage. Yes. Like even though Greg Ginn liked Grateful Dead, you know, <laughs> he didn't talk about it that much. Yeah. Um, yeah. But there's also definitely a um, kind of connecting thread between punk and metal and free jazz, which yep. is just about like being hit in the face by sound. Yeah, absolutely. Um, which never really appealed to me that much, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, that doesn't mean it's not a real thing. <laughs> right, right. Well, but there, but there's, there's, there's what you were talking about the, the sort of being able to play something that's sit in front, that's stuck in front of you. The sort of the virtuosity aspect of it, which I would say in some ways punk is sort of opposed to, or at least some aspects of punk or some forms of punk. But it's interesting then in the experimental realm because I feel like there is a lot of experimentation to that works against virtuosity sort of new instrument building, electronic music, things like that, where people are developing new algorithms, but there isn't any virtuosity developed with it. Well, are, are you originally from LA? No, I'm from Wisconsin. Oh, all right. <laughs> well, okay, here's, here's a, a yeah. crackpot theory about LA musicians. Okay. Which is like, like comparing the LA scene to the Bay Area scene. Mm -hmm. L.A., because there is the commercial music right. business here, a lot of people here have some relationship to commercial music. Sure. Um, that, that, you know, Vinnie Golia is on some film scores. Mm -hmm. Stuart Liebig is on some singer-songwriter records. Nels is on some singer-songwriter mm -hmm. records, right? Um, that, that's, that's out there. Right? right, and that's kind of that's a a connection, right? And it can be something really cool, right? I mean, maybe Joni Mitchell's going to call you, right? Yeah, right. Um, in the Bay Area, forget about it. You can go full on Harry Parch, you know? Right. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. sure. And uh, have you been in in Southern California for most of your life? Would you say I, I was born here? I went to high school. I went to up to high school here. Then I went away. Uh, to college and grad school, and I moved back here in uh, 2000. Okay, yeah, I, I think I saw on a, a profile of yours that you 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 ended up at, at at UT Austin at one point. Well, I went there for library school. Okay, cool. That um, I I got uh, I was ABD, and I um, kind of looked at the people coming out of my program who I thought were smarter than me and what kind of jobs they were getting. And they were like becoming bartenders or they, they were oh, teaching yeah. freshman comp at like three right. different community colleges mm -hmm. and spending their whole lives on the freeway. 
And I just thought, well, I don't want to die in Ohio. Not to be too melodramatic, but... <laughs> that was at Bowling Green? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, um, you know, time for the backup plan, become a librarian. I see, um, I see. Okay. And um, which actually relates very closely to, uh, to music, because when I was in, uh, in junior high, I started playing uh, guitar in a community big band. Hmm. That's how hard it is to find a guitar player who can sight read. You, you know. um, <laughs> yeah, junior high, that's young for that. Anyways, I didn't say I was good at it. Um, so, <laughs> But still, that's cool. So the um, piano player and, the trombone, and one of the trombonists in that band were both music librarians at UCLA. Mm -hmm. And they seemed like the coolest guys I'd ever met. Because they were the first people I'd met who'd like memorized a lot of tunes. Yeah. Which seemed magical to me later i mean I it's kind of a superpower if you really have a big bank in your head yeah later yeah. i realized they, they, that the piano player played the same turnaround on everything but that's <laughs> fine too um yeah and uh but that they would uh he would bring in stuff uh they would get donations to mm -hmm. the ucla uh, music library like people's archives and we'd be reading like you know uh I don't know, like charts that Henry Mancini had written for some like, you know, TV special in the 60s, wow. you know, and things like that. Uh, it was, so I'm like, oh, well, you know, that's maybe something I could do, you know, maybe I could be like them, you know. And were you and, still on guitar at this point? No, well, I kind of, I kind of stopped playing guitar in front of people when I was in grad school. I really fell in love with the string bass when I was about mm -hmm. 20, but I kept playing the guitar too. But um, when I moved back to LA in 2000, I really, I've, I think I've played guitar in public twice since then. Okay. Because there are so many guitar players who here who, you know, who have really found like unique voices on mm -hmm. the instrument, you know, like it's, like, like I could probably do like a cover band gig and that would be fun. But, sure. um, you know, to, to, you know, to hang out with Jim McCauley or Jay Stinson or Carrie mm -hmm. Fossey or whoever. And then, you know, those guys have all found like a thing. Right. You know, right. They don't sound like anybody else, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. difficult because so, well, I'm sure you can relate to this, right? I mean, it seems like so much has been done on the guitar. There's so many possibilities, but there's also so many people digging in that mine. It's true. It's true. And get, guitar is tough. I feel like guitar has a little bit of that, the, the technological side limiting virtuosity sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I find this with, with jazz guitar, especially older styles of jazz guitar, the tone is so sweet that it's very difficult to do anything uh, really harsh on it, or like what we were saying, getting hit in the face with sound. I actually find something similar sometimes with piano, especially the equal temperament, e mm. e evens out a lot of the dissonance. So like, you can beat the piano and nothing bad's gonna happen. <laughs> but 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 you, but you get some real dissonance with uh, with with uh, bowed strings, and it's wild. Um, but so then guitar players, I seek you know use pedals, seek technology to expand their voice. And I think electric guitar can be extremely expressive because of that. But at the same time, you can end up getting lost in this world of, of pedals and things like that and not, not develop uh, any technical virtuosity, not that you necessarily need to, but it's, it's an interesting issue with, with guitar specifically, I think. Yeah, I saw Lee Ronaldo play solo at the Getty a couple of years ago. Oh, cool. Maybe more than a couple of years ago. And, you know, there was definitely no conventional mm -hmm. virtuosity, but there was definitely, you know, he is definitely a master of what he does. Right, right. Um, I, yeah, I, 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 keep, I keep, I think about it all the time, the, the idea of virtuosity and, and does it matter? And then I guess the answer is sort of yes and no, depending on what you're doing. So if you're a session musician, like you're talking about, you have to be able to play what's in front of you. You can't be like, oh, no, 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 I'm going to put like playing cards in my strings and do something like that. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> but um, well, but at the same time, the, the artistic expression, the, the developing your voice, you can become uh, 
a, a musician with a voice or or an artist who does something powerful without necessarily being able to play all the scales the way that somebody might want you to. Yeah, maybe there's another uh, sort of, you know, root in here, which would be, I mean, Steve Lacey is a great example of this. Mm -hmm. I mean, it may be, uh, you know, maybe Nels Klein is, you know, we could think of a lot of other names, but people who right. can fit into any situation and still sound like themselves. Yes, that that's a that's a skill too. Not getting not getting dragged around by the music, but being able to be you in that music. Yeah, yeah, have, even, having even, a voice, even if they're you know. Even, you know, if you're not improvising, like mm -hmm. just when Steve Lacey is playing, a, you know, a melody in a, the Eleven's record or something, yeah. you know, yeah. there's no question that that's him. So I'm interested in a little bit of a little bit of, of your history in, in getting from playing in a big band as a guitar player in, in junior high, all the way to, to uh, studying library sciences at, uh, at, at UT, UT Austin. So what, what was the trajectory, the path? sort of all over the country. <laughs> well, I was an English major at uh, University of, uh, at, at uh, UC Santa Cruz. Okay, cool. And then I actually, I was kind of hanging out there for a year after I graduated, playing in a sort of hippie country band. Okay. That played uh, kind of, uh, you know, Grateful Dead and Bob Dylan and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the band and hippie country music, right? I mean, some bluegrass stuff. Um, right. It was fiddle, acoustic guitar. I was playing electric bass, and we had a drummer. And the drummer uh, couldn't use his legs. He was in oh. a, a wheelchair. Wow. Okay. Which So no bass drum, which left a lot of... It wasn't like a Def Leppard situation. <laughs> he just didn't play the bass drum. Yeah. So it left a lot of room for me to overplay... Uh -huh. Which was wow. good because I was listening to Primus and Mike Watt and all yeah, this really, cool. you know, it was, I'm sure it was horrible, but, <laughs> but we, but we were doing all right. Uh -huh. uh, I, I should say I, you know, it was horrible. My contribution, the other people were great. Um, but uh, anyway, at some point uh, I was in the, um, the, the library at, at UC and saw a copy of the Journal of Popular Culture. Mm -hmm. uh which was published by um, the, the um, Popular Culture Department at Bowling Green State. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of the first time that I had realized that, I, that you could use the skills that I had been taught to use on literature to talk about other stuff. Mm -hmm. Like Santa Cruz is a very hip English department in terms, at least in the 80s, it was very hip in terms of... Um, of critical theory stuff, right? This is like okay. a heyday of like deconstruction and postmodernism uh -huh. and all those things. Um, but we were really like not dealing with um, popular culture at all. Mm. Um, you know, it was definitely high art literature. Right. And um, which may have had to do with my course selections. I don't know. But in any case, I was like, well, geez, what am I going to do now? You know, I... I don't want to write another book about James Joyce. You know, the world does not need another book on James <laughs> Joyce. Right. Um, but then I saw this journal and I was like, well, I could write, I could bring the same kind of interpretive stuff, you know, to, to talk about like something that people actually care about, you know, sure. uh, uh, you know, rock music or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I got into that program and I went there and, you know, was not a great fit, but once I was there, I was kind of stuck there. And long story short, ended up writing the um, my dissertation about uh, free jazz and and the black arts movement, uh, in part to get more depth on this music that mm -hmm. I felt very attached to, uh, and also because I thought it might be, you know. Uh, good professionally uh, in sure. terms of like English departments, music mm -hmm. departments, ethnic studies mm -hmm. departments. Um, it also connects back to something I did when I, at Santa Cruz, which was I wrote a, a biography of Albert Eiler. Oh, okay. Um, I, in the summers, I would um, stay in town and a bunch of us would just get like a house and just hang out in the house, you know. And um, I worked campus catering Okay. Which was kind of a good job because it, I could steal enough food to <laughs> get everyone in the house. Nice. Um, and also, you know, often I'd do 
like a lunch service and a dinner service. And in between, I could go to the library. Mm -hmm. And um, I got really interested in Albert Eiler because of this track called uh, Change Has Come, which was on this Impulse compilation. Okay. It was like a triple LP compilation. Um, I think it was called Energy Essentials. They did a few okay. of these. Um, and I was able to get them at Rhino Records for pretty cheap. I bought up everyone's vinyl when they dumped it to buy CDs. Suckers. Um, <laughs> yes. So then I'm like, what? what is this? You know, I got to find out what's going on with this. So had you listened to, re- to things like that before? Or was this the first uh, that was the, experience that was, with it? I, I, I mean, of course, I'd heard like, why well, not? Of course, but you know, I'd heard Ascension, I'd heard, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Pharaoh Sanders, I'd heard sure. Archie Shep, but this, mm-hmm. uh, it's just so much more extreme. Yeah, uh, and the the emotional register of it was not like anything I'd ever mm-hmm. heard. Um, I don't know. You know, my friend Robert Regal could probably tell you, you know, what ethnomusicology kind of recordings from what parts of the world, what sort of trance musics of North Africa or whatever it uh-huh. might connect to. But, you know, for me, forget about it. Um, so I had to find out what was going on. Uh-huh. And so I started reading everything that I could. And then I started putting it together into a narrative. And eventually uh-huh. I had a, I had a, a sort of a book. Um and this was undergrad. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's impressive. Uh, not really. I mean, it was just sort of an accumulation. Um, but it's, I mean, an interest, a focus. Yeah. It was, yeah. Kind, of a, it was kind of an obsession. Oh, yeah. and also, um, you know, all, most, all, all of the LPs were out of print at the time. They had them at the library. And they had pianos in the listening rooms in the library. <laughs> so I would try to, like, transcribe stuff. Oh, great. I mean, of course, not the solos. That would be insane. <laughs> just... Uh, but you know, just the heads, and that somebody's too probably because those yeah. heads are, are you know, they're pretty diatonic. They're within my you know extremely limited uh, ear skills. Um, so that thing, um, I tried to sell it to publishers, and mm-hmm. you know, I had no idea what I was doing at all. Um, but uh, once when I got to Bowling Green in the early 90s. There was like dial-up internet. It was pre, uh, pre-graphical interface web. But, mm-hmm. you know, I, so I stuck the word document online and people started reading it and it was wow. very exciting. And probably more, as many people probably read it as if I had, you know, you know, done a u- university press book or whatever. But, um, but yeah, I really had no idea what I was doing. Um, so... A lot of the the work I've done since has been kind of building the context around this thing. I see. Uh, Not intentionally, right? Uh But like, I look back at at like like when I wrote that, I really, I don't know if I'd even read the autobiography of Malcolm X. You know, I was pretty Mm. oblivious. So, you know, um. But but I hear from people who were really affected by that book. Um, wow! So that's that's very moving and a little bit scary, mm-hmm. you know. You throw 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 a bottle in the ocean and it washes up on a beach somewhere. Right, and it's also the work. I mean, you poured you poured over these these albums and, and the work you put into it. I mean, it must feel great having it having your work be powerful like that. Maybe it's a little scary. Because sure, it sure, is, sure. You know. At this point, you know, 30 years ago, and, you know, you don't want necessarily, uh, yeah. a, you know, your garage, your, you know, high school garage band <laughs> record to go viral on YouTube or whatever. It's true, but there, there is, there is something interesting about the, 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 the progression of, uh, of any, anybody's artistic or academic life about the way, the way they come into it. And I know a lot of, people who feel like they were better composers before they learned anything about music mm-hmm. and things like that. And, and uh, obviously you're not saying anything quite like that, but the, the progression from the, the less mature work where you, where you have that obsession and that drive versus the more mature work, sort of looking back at it with the, the experienced eyes or something like that. It's sort of oh, interesting no, to see I'm, the whole I'm, progression. I'm more obsessed now. 
Great. <laughs> That's even better. <laughs> because, uh, I mean, obsession, I, 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 I think like many, you know, young people, especially young dudes, I didn't really understand the discipline part of it. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So how, how has the obsession then shifted with, with discipline added? It sounds disciplined, by the way. The story of uh, in between all of your shifts going to the library. <laughs> not the typical college student. I don't know about that. But, um, well, I, I, gosh. Maybe I could talk about it in terms of, like, uh, like improvisers. Uh-huh. Right? Sure. Like... Like, I listen to Alan Silva, right? I'm, I'm going to talk mm -hmm. about bass players because I am one. And I think, you know, here, I'll get the bass. Great. I mean, I mean, no disrespect to Alan Silva at all, you know. I, <laughs> and I, I mean, this is totally artistically valid, right? But sometimes he's just, he's, he's doing this. <laughs> Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. And it sounds awesome. Yeah. Um, but like Mark Dresser will do that, and he knows what the notes are. Right. Doesn't make yeah. it better. Yeah. But but it's a possibility. Yeah. And I definitely wouldn't say that you know that Mark is any less creative than Alan. Sure. You know, having that knowledge doesn't hurt him one bit. Right. Do you think it helps? Do you, Do you think that there's a difference because of that knowledge? I or there's a difference, I suppose, but it enables him to do different stuff. Sure. Um, that was a lot of schlepping for a small point. But. No, it was great. So, are, are, is the analogy that you're drawing that sort of now you quote know the notes, and so you, it it enables you to do different stuff when the output is similar or something like that? I don't know. But, okay. Um, it's also like a moving target, like mm -hmm. both uh, creatively and academically. Um, like, hang on, now that I'm like doing props, I guess I have more. Hang it's on. great. I love it. So you can edit out all of this dead air. Yeah, it's okay. <sighs> Sorry about that. No problem. That's so great. this guy, John Gray, wrote a book called Fire Music, a bibliography of the new jazz. Uh -huh. And it goes up to 1990. Okay. And so not only is that basically pre-internet, yeah. but it also predates almost all of the academic journals. Uh, oh, okay. To jazz. Uh -huh. There is a journal of jazz studies, or annual review of jazz studies out of Newark, but... Since then, there's like jazz and culture, right, there's right. Uh, uh, critical studies and improvisation. There's like mm -hmm. five of them. Right. Um, so that's a big thing by the time I get to this, right, uh -huh. is I can kind of pick up where, where John left off. Right, this, absolutely. Uh, you know, it's a very different kind of discourse if you're writing for a you know, peer-reviewed journal than if you're writing for, you know, downbeat or cadence or whatever. Yes, yep. Um, and I think that's true of the music, too, in some ways, that um, the, the kind of mental virtuosity, if not physical virtuosity, I think, has just gone through the roof. Yes. Um, that... Um, you know, the, the the I mean, we talked a little bit about about Henry Threadgill, you know, mm -hmm. but um, I think there's a lot of people dealing with you know very highly mm -hmm. 
just things that makes make make you know very different kinds of demands of the, the, the players. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So you mentioned a moving target. What what would you say the target is for you? Just being able to do the job, right? Uh huh. Like that. Like there's a certain. You know, whether it's to get an article in a certain mm -hmm. journal mm -hmm. or to be able to get on stage with a certain artist and hang, mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the skills, there's something that, you know, you know, what Taishan Sori will ask of his band is very different than what David Murray will ask right. of his band. Mm -hmm. um, different, different kinds of virtuosity, I guess. Yeah. Um, and... Um, yeah, I think also, you know, just to to get back a little bit to my to my mm -hmm. uh, sort of performing thing. I mean, at one point you were, near the beginning of this, you were talking about like do the classical stuff, do the uh -huh. jazz stuff, do the improvising stuff. Mm -hmm. But for me, like the really like the place where they all meet, mm -hmm. right? Which is in large part the music of the ACM, right? Right. Mm -hmm. But also um, Europeans. I work a lot with Andrea Centazzo. Mm -hmm. um, cool. And, um, you know, that sort of space where there's a combination of system and freedom. Right. And um, yeah. Um, Uh, Stephen Schick has a really great book, The Percussionist, uh, yes. who teaches in San Diego, uh, mm -hmm. called Same Bed, Different Dreams, which is about being a new music percussionist. Mm -hmm. And he talks about learning uh, some of the core pieces of like his repertoire by like, like Feldman, uh, King of Denmark, and Stockhausen Zyklus, and I forget which uh, right. Zanakis piece it is, but I couldn't mm -hmm. pronounce it anyway. And then uh, Bone Alphabet by Fernahue and a couple mm -hmm. other things. Yep. And for each of these pieces, the first thing he has to figure out is how to learn them. Right. That they are asking you to do stuff that doesn't, you know, mm -hmm. if you, you know, if you're playing orchestra music, they're not going to put anything in front of us in the orchestra that we don't know how to play. Right. Um. I mean, it might be fast, it might, you know, but it's yep. not, you know. You're um, going to know how to know how to play it. Yeah. There's not going to be, I'm not going to need to figure out how to count 17 against 5 or how to, <laughs> like, consistently alternate between the 15th and 13th partials or yep. something like that, you know. <laughs> That's cool. Yep. And, um, yeah, I think I encountered this book maybe at the same time that I was... Uh, uh, playing with Adam Rudolph, I play in his band okay. when he comes to LA, uh, uh, because you know it's much, his music is, I think, a much, at least for me, made uh, a sort of a milder version of the kind of demands that Steve Schick was, mm -hmm. uh, because Adam will do something like, um, like layer different subdivisions of an odd time, right? You know, mm -hmm. so. You know, if he has 10, maybe some people are going to be playing 3-3-2-2, three, three, two, two, and some people right. are going to be playing 3-2-2-3, three, two, two, three, uh -huh. and, you know. So you get, yeah. And just to learn to feel that. That's mm -hmm. not something that, you know, I'm not sure that specific thing exists anywhere else. Sure. I mean, that, that obviously there's African stuff in there, but mm -hmm. he's combining it with Indian stuff, he, and then he has his own... You know, mm -hmm. so, so figuring out how to practice that. Yes, absolutely. You know? So that's a, a much milder version, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, for Steve Schick, that's like half a bar of Fernahue. But for me, it was like <laughs> a couple of weeks of walking around going, you know. Yep, yep. Well, exactly. You're internalizing in your body yeah. the same as yeah. Soundgarden. That's great. I think you have to. I, I, I was listening to a, a Fernie Hill recording with, with the bass player in my band who mm. is not familiar with that kind of music at all. Um, and I showed him the score and he just rolled his eyes. He said, it's ridiculous. And he didn't believe that they were going to play it right. 
and we're listening to it and it's, it's sort of clear like oh they're they're actually playing this and they're actually playing it right and it's it's wild once you start to hear how they're embodying it because they come in together they're feeling it together it's it's amazing well i'm not sure i mean is i i think it is ridiculous uh-huh but but i think that's fine sure you know? sure 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 um and really if he wanted an exact performance he would have done you know a midi realization or something uh-huh sure i don't know i think about this a lot with frank zappa a lot of LA musicians, you know, especially love Frank Zappa. And mm -hmm. I, you know, don't. <laughs> Actually, I, I kind of agree with you. I also um, don't really like Frank Zappa. I'm not supposed to not like him. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that thing of like, like, like this has to be 17. Why mm. does it have to be 17? Right, right. right? Like, in, like in Adam Rudolph's music, it has to be 17 so it fits into pocket with the, uh -huh. you know, with the tabla player who's playing the different version uh -huh. of the 17. But if it's a solo clarinet piece and there's 17 and you rush it, you know. Right. Um, yeah, it seems just bossiness to sure to sure play. sure i can see that yeah the like the the authoritarianism of a of a complex score sometimes for sure i mean i, I things i i'm definitely in favor of things being hard but not harder than they have to be right right so no, you don't like non-functional difficulty well that makes sense <laughs> i mean i i think part of fernahue and I don't know him, his music that well. Uh -huh. or, I mean, I, but I feel a part of it is the struggle. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, I think that there's stuff in there which is, you know, literally physically impossible to play. Mm -hmm. And so the, the choices that you'll make about, you know, which of those notes you can grab are, you know. Yep, is, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, it's true. Because it, it's, it's an extreme example. And, uh, yeah. So, uh, what coming up to, to where I usually like to have, have the improv section, but, uh, what, what, what's coming up? What's coming up for you? What do you got? Oh, you have your book coming out. I have the book coming out. Uh, that's really not until next, next June for, okay. the, for the humans, uh, <laughs> a year from now. I haven't talked about this book in this month yet. It's oh, a great. year from now. Wow. <laughs> it's like soon ish. Yeah. Um, uh, this Saturday, if people are listening to this in real time, of course, uh, June 11th, June 11th uh, okay. the Andrea Centazzo West Coast Chamber Jazz Trio, which is Andrea, myself, and Ellen Burr on flutes, are playing at Alva's showroom in Pedro. Cool. Uh, I put on Facebook that I tagged Mike Watt. I said I'd put him on a guest list, but we'll see if he actually comes. Uh, uh, I, I mentioned I was at Disney Hall last night, right. and uh, I, my wife was trying to impress one of our friends by saying that I'd played there. Uh, I played there on a Glenn Branca piece for 100 electric guitars. I was one of oh. the 20 electric bass players, along with Watt. Okay. Which is pretty great, cool. because Watt is definitely one of my heroes. Mm -hmm. um, there was definitely a period when I was playing the electric bass where my approach was to just take things he had played and make them fit into the songs my band played. <laughs> um, but, uh, so that's coming up. Uh, two sets, 15 bucks. Great. Uh, at Alva's. And this is a really interesting group, I think, in terms of like the kind of multiple virtuosities and creativity and all that mm. stuff. Because like when I started playing with, with Andrea, I thought we were going to be doing like like all for improvisation mm -hmm. uh, because like he has all these records with like Evan Parker and Elliot Sharp and you know mm -hmm. uh, Derek Bailey and you know but um, and and the, we made a record like that with uh, Charles Sharp playing reeds and stuff called uh, Next, mm -hmm. uh, which is on on Ictus and you can get it on the Bandcamp, um, but. Um, Andrea wanted to play some compositions, and uh, 
it ended up that those worked better uh, with uh, Ellen Burr playing flutes. So, mm -hmm. uh, so we're playing, you know, compositions. Um, and some of it is like melody and then free improvisation. Some of uh -huh. it is melody and then improvising over a vamp. Mm -hmm. um, some of it we are playing along with um, like loops. Oh, okay. That, that he's made. Often it'll be like, uh, uh, vibraphone playing a uh, chord progression. Mm -hmm. And then we have, you know, just to fill out the band, but it never occurred to me that I would be playing with one of the pioneers of European free improvisation and playing a written bass line along with the loop. You know, it's the same thing I'd be doing if I was playing with Rihanna. Yeah. Um, so that's very interesting. And also like a kind of, you know, a skill that, you know, I don't know, hadn't had to do that before. I mean, I, I played a lot with, uh, you know, loop pedals before that mm -hmm. got kind of tedious. So for the audience, I mean, yep. uh, so, uh, you know, so, so, you know, I'm familiar with that, mm -hmm. but it's, but it's still, it's a specific thing that, you know, anyway, um, so, so that's, a, it's a really interesting band. We're kind of revisiting material throughout Andrea's career because he's written for a lot of different ensembles. Mm -hmm. uh, he's written film music, uh, as well as music for improvisers and, um, and for classical groups. And we kind of take it and there's, you know, free improvisation in it, mm -hmm. but also Andrea put West coast in the, in the name of the group, because there's like this cool jazz element. Mm, um, cool. especially since it's flute fronted, we're in kind of the tradition of the great, uh, LA flute, you know, music, Bud Shank, uh, Hubert Laws, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you want to count Eric Dolphy in there. Um, just, but, um, yeah, you know, Nicole Mitchell for a minute, yep. you know, mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's a really fun band. So we're, we're doing, we're playing at, um, at Alves, and then um, we're going to Europe in July. Oh, wow. Uh, there's going to be a four-day festival of Andrea's music in Milan. Great. Uh, there will be kind of mix and match free improvisation, mm -hmm. uh, I think three or four sets every night. Um, uh -huh. And it, uh, it's including a collaborators from all over. Uh, Elliot Sharp will be there. Uh, okay. Elizabeth Harnick, who's a great pianist, I think from Vienna. Okay. I'm really looking forward to, 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 to hearing her. I don't know if I get to play with her. A uh, lot, of, lot of Europeans, a few New Yorkers. Steve Swell, the trombonist, is mm -hmm. coming. Cool. Uh, That's great. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very exciting. We're playing one set of the, uh, of the written music, the trio, with an actual live vibraphonist, which will be uh, uh, pretty cool. And then we're going to do a couple of other dates, you know, uh, in, I think in Northern Italy, maybe it's something in uh, Slovenia or Switzerland. Okay, cool. And, bef and before that, um, Ellen and I have a monthly night at the Industry Cafe and Jazz, which is an Ethiopian restaurant in Culver City. Great. And we had that pre-COVID, mm -hmm. and we were... Um, Every month we would bring in different people to play with us. Um, and mm -hmm. sometimes we'd play free improvisation and sometimes we would play tunes. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes, uh, you know, standard standards, sometimes stuff that I wanted to try out, like we did uh, a night of Sonny Sharrock music, mm. which was, was pretty great. Uh, it was It was interesting to kind of uh, soften it up so that it could be fronted by, fronted by flute. Oh yeah, um, and also have have you know the upright bass and all mm -hmm. that. Um, but of course, you know, Sonny played with Herbie Mann, so it wasn't that hard to kind of back it up and imagine what it would have sound like if they had played his tunes. Right. Right. Although Ellen is a much better flute player than Herbie Mann. Um, <laughs> there, so. And it was really, it's great to have like a regular mm -hmm. gig, mm -hmm. you know, um, and to have something to like offer people. Mm -hmm. Like there, you you like, you, you run into musicians and you're like, oh, you're so cool. We should do something together. 
but you know it's to, so to have a place to do that you mm -hmm. know to say yes. oh, well you know uh week from yep. thursday you know mm -hmm. come and play with us yep um so we did so we did some crazy stuff um but um and the the owner of the restaurant is amazing he never complained about what we played wow that's and great we played some some absolutely crazy stuff i mean we did a uh, sat there with they had like a very poorly maintained piano uh -huh. so i'm like oh i want vicky ray to come and play this piano you know and she did we did a trio set with with vicky ray great it was, it was extremely enjoyable she played the stylophone a lot hmm. which is like a tiny it looks like a pocket calculator billy preston has I, one for this? about 10 minutes this. in the uh get back documentary oh okay somebody brings it uh Anyway, it's it's like a kind of a almost like a touch screen. I'm sure there, there's an iPhone app that does it now, of course. <laughs> yeah. But in you know, you just have a little stylus, hence the name, and ah, there's a keyboard drawn on the panel, and you just kind of wiggle it on there, and it makes sounds. Crazy yeah. little music interfaces. Yeah, yeah. So you know, Billy Preston, of course, can immediately play whatever song they were woodshedding on it, <laughs> but you know, John Lennon gets it and goes, Boop, "This is terrible." <laughs> Um, yeah. The end. Um, so, since the, the the they they have a nice outdoor setup. I'm talking way too long about this stuff. It's okay. It's okay. It's it. They have a nice outdoor seating setup, uh, and we've been playing more tunes and having mm -hmm. more of a regular band, which I started calling the Soapbox because we, I kind of put it together because I was getting asked to play different political fundraisers. Mm. So I'm like, oh, what's the, you know, good name for uh nice. Yep. I kind of crowdsourced it. My my first idea was the Grant Green New Deal, because <laughs> the first version was a guitar trio. Oh, but, okay. But that's not that good. Somebody soapbox is a lot better. That's great. Yeah, that's a good one. So the basic lineup is Charles Sharp, Ellen Burr, R. Scott Dibble on keyboard, myself, and uh, Peter Valsamas on the drums. Mm. Great. And um We've been kind of building a book of, we play some of Charles's music, which mm -hmm. is a lot of like odd meter vamps. And then uh, sort of, you know, outside jazz repertoire that, that he and I have been, you know, transcribing or mm. finding online. So some uh, uh, Henry Threadgill and Bobby Bradford and Ornette and, mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, it's like we were talking about before, like, well, you know, there's, does it matter what head you play if you're going to play rhythm changes and be flat? Right. Um, and, you know, maybe at least, you know, you could surprise yourself by playing a Bobby Bradford tune instead of an Ornette tune, you know, right. maybe, maybe Bobby will get, you know, a penny from ASCAP at some point. Right. For yeah, yeah, tune. right, right. Um, so. So that's so we've been working out that band pretty regularly. Uh, Great! It's the the th third Friday of every month, and it's it's back up and running. Us. Yeah, it's that's it's great. outdoors. Okay. Uh, so it's it's pretty safe as mm -hmm. far as I can tell. Uh -huh. And since we're playing, you know, more or less tune like material uh, rather than you know stylophone improvisations, um, it's. Uh, you know, I always worry about playing for people who didn't come to hear the music. Right. The, it is tough at a restaurant, but uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's great that you have that outlet, though. The yeah, regular outlet. But, but also just as a listener, like I remember going to Rocco's. Uh -huh. I don't know if this is, bef this is probably before your time. I'm not but, sure. Uh, uh, Rocco Samosi, who does the Angel City Jazz Festival. Oh, okay. Before he got that role, and he had a couple of different venues, mm -hmm. and he kept trying to combine fine dining and avant-garde music. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I like I like both of those things, but not necessarily <laughs> at the same time. I, I, I'm imagining going to to vibratos or something like that. Well, actually, vibrato was Rocco's. Oh, before, okay. Before Herb Alpert bought it. Okay. I mean, he had a partner who did the food program, and mm -hmm. I think the last time I was there was to see uh, to see Zoni Mash, maybe. Okay. The Wayne Horvitz band, mm -hmm. which you know they play 
some some nice tunes and grooves, but they also take them way way out. Yeah. So, I wow. think there were people you know who came to have a you know forty dollar pasta who you know. Really <laughs> what is this? Or, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's great that he believed in the music that way, but it's a little insane. Yeah, I mean, we're all a little insane. Yeah, that's okay. That's all right. Do you wanna do you wanna play a little bit? Oh, try yeah. it out. Let's oh, yeah. let's try it. Yeah, I'm I might gonna set up a good mic just for my voice. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna grab my banjo. I think. Nice. All right. That was great. Actually, I, I also love listening afterwards on Zoom because the experience while playing it is quite different than the final product. Mm. That was cool. All right. Well, <laughs> fun. Yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks so much for, for coming and talking to me. About about your work, about your thoughts about music and all that. Oh, of course. Oh, yeah. I should put the mic back. Up in my face. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Uh, yeah. It's 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 you know kind of strange and cool to to get to know someone on on the recording. You know. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Well, uh, I, I mean, it, it was fun. It was fun to get to play together a little bit. Mm -hmm. Is there is there anywhere yeah. in particular you want to direct people, any of the, the listeners, to? Uh, well, I mean, my website find... is uh, you know jeffschwartzmusic.wordpress.com, and I do you know update that pretty regularly, and I'm pretty easy to find on social media. Mm -hmm. And uh, if by any chance you are listening to this, you probably won't put this online uh, like immediately. Next week is next week. Okay, yep. so I won't tell people to vote. Okay, <laughs> okay. Too late for that. Okay. But if you didn't vote, you should have. You should have. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, thanks so much, Jeff. Oh, good to good to good to chat.
Yeah. See you again soon. Thanks for listening or watching. That was Jeff Schwartz. Please remember to check him out with links below. And remember to like, leave a comment, and subscribe to my channels. See you next time. Thank <laughs> you.